Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning. So my name is Marie Butarakis. I'll be your moderator for today's event. I'm a nutritionist from Wageningen Center for Development Innovation. And here with the team, we'd like to welcome you uh, to this morning's Future of Food event. So we have a super jam-packed event. We've got presentations, we've got games, we've got puppet shows, um, and a lot of engagement from, from the audience. So we're really excited to present uh, this today. So that I can give you a bit of a background of what to expect, I'm going to invite our two hosts, uh, Miriam Trost, who many of you may know as the WER Student Challenge Coordinator, and Simon van Berkham, who is working at Wageningen Economic and Social Research, and he's the project coordinator for the project that's funding some of this event today. They'll give you a bit of background of what to expect and what this day is all about. So, I would like to invite Miriam and Simon to the stage. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Marie. So it's so good to see all of you. We've been working for half a year on our end of the project, and I think also the teams in, uh, in the project of the Imagine Food Systems 2100 have been working very hard. Um, my name is Miriam Troost. I am at the Aver Student Challenges team, and I don't know if anybody heard of the student challenges that we organize at Wagner University. Just to raise your hand if you have. I hope especially the students, they know. Um, we've been organizing student challenges uh, since uh, six years. Uh, they are open for students from all over the world, so not only Wageningen University uh, and research students. Um, so, and this year we have a very special one, the Food Systems Innovation Challenge. And um, so we, have, we brought a lot of youth from all over the world, from nine universities, uh, mainly from the Global South. They will do their pitches today. There are Some of them are sitting there. They are a little bit nervous, but uh, I think we will all cheer them and uh, that it will be fine. And, um, and then we talked to Simon. Simon um, was also organizing uh, an e a program with experts from Wageningen University and Research. So we thought, how beautiful would it be to combine the two groups and we see a lot of, yeah, we see young, old, everything sitting here. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, age is not, uh, doesn't matter. But uh, so we I talked to Simon and said, okay, let's do this thing at the same day. Because then we can bring a lot of people together that are all working on food systems. And then we can learn from each other. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of the history where this event uh, came to, uh, to play. So I want to give the microphone to my co-host, uh, Simon. <laughs> Well, what else to say? Um, actually, uh, yeah, working on, say, uh, feeding the world, the growing world population uh, is one of, uh, while also, say, respecting the, the planetary boundaries, that is one of the biggest challenges uh, we have uh, for this generation, but also for the next generation. Uh, and we at Wageningen uh, Research, uh, researchers at Wageningen, actually working a lot on this type uh, type of, uh, of of questions, and uh, uh, we do that for for national clients, also for international uh, governments and, and organizations. But we also have, uh, say, this uh, KB funding, Kenneth basis, uh, so knowledge base, which we can program a little bit more. Say, uh, according to our own research agenda, we have a bit more flexibility. Uh, to follow our our own interests uh, and and it's a bit more fundamental also curio curiosity driven research and in this KB we actually we thought this year uh, it would be very nice to to have uh, um, a, a a call out to ask researchers for yeah their vision on say a future food system imagine food system uh, twenty one hundred. So taking a long-term perspective, and uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm to, to respond to that call. I think uh, we got more than 20 proposals. And what you will see today uh, is, uh, say, the uh, presentations of uh, what we selected as was, say, the most interesting and exciting and inspiring uh, proposals. Um, so I'm very happy to, uh, to be here also uh, and collaborating with with the, with the student challenge because yeah I think at the end say the the, the old the, the young the, the students the, the more experienced research we all have to work on this on this issue and to uh, to, to shape uh, say our food systems uh, uh, to the better 
So I'm looking very much forward to, to the presentations and I'm, and I'm sure it will be a very, very inspiring day. Thank you. Great, thank you, Miriam and Seaman. So as you can see, we've got two events uh, merged into one. So we have the student pitches and we also have the presentation from researchers as part of the KB35 project. And Seaman did touch on this, but why do we care about transforming our food system? Why is it important? Seaman mentioned that it's for our generation, but also for future generations. But it's also important to keep in mind that this is all about making sure that everyone has access to safe, affordable and nutritious food all year round. And not just us, not just some countries close by, but everywhere. And remember that it's all year round as well. It's not just sometimes. So it's important to keep that in your mind as we go through today. And that's what both the students are working towards, but also researchers at Wageningen University. So, I would like to introduce our first presentation, and our first presentation is Esmer and her team. Um, Esmer um, is from the um, Wageningen Food Safety Research, and together with an inter interdisciplinary visionary game team um, that has both scientists and non-scientists, which is always nice to see in the, in, in the same uh, team. So, several of the team members are present today, and together they developed a board game. And the board game is about a vision for building um, a, a safe food system, and it's using a safe by design approach. So the game is called Safer to 2100. Now, I just want to highlight that you may have a chance to ask questions to Esme and the team throughout the presentation, but if you don't, they'll be here throughout the day, and they'll also have a presentation over lunch as well that you can interact more with the team. Thanks very much, Esme and team. Please take it away. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, my name is uh, Esmer, uh, and I'm here today presenting our game. It's an honor also three of my team members will present today. But actually I would say that almost the whole team is here. They are all sitting there in the back. I have some pictures of them later, so in case you want to come uh, talk to us later on the day, feel free to come. So maybe next slide, please. Uh, so I will first introduce you uh, what this game is about. And we developed a game that is meant for vision development with a group of people. So it's a board game where uh, groups of people think about together about the future food system. And you can say actually that the F in SAFER is of food, the E is actually of environment, uh, and the food environment uh, system of course interact, and the R is of resilience, which is also very important in future food systems. So we'll introduce you a bit to the game, and after me, we'll have three of the team members uh, also sharing with you some insights, because we, uh, in this project we developed the game, but we also played the game with groups of people, different groups of people, and we will share with you some insights from that. And in the end, I will close actually with an invitation for you to also think together on the future food system. So, thanks. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll first introduce to you the team, and as already said, this team had scientists in it, but also non-scientists, so you can see who worked on that. We had scientific experts from WUR, we have the two game designers also on the slide who actually made this game, and then we actually also have people here uh, that we thought would maybe still be... Ah, thanks, yeah. <laughs> still, um, yeah, perfect, <laughs> thanks that would maybe still live in 2100, because it, we thought it would be interesting to also <laughs> play this game with people who are actually there. Uh, so the objectives of this board game were to be inspired by stakeholders and experts from the food system. Uh, so these are professional experts that they know a lot about the current food system, exchange ideas, and also we notice that actually nowadays people have very different perceptions of the future directions of society. And this is also about the future directions for the food system and the environment. Um, at least I'm from the Netherlands, it's super relevant here. People just have completely different ideas on where to go. And this game facilitates to share your opinion and to think together on what would be good solutions. Also, we invite people in this game to think on innovative approaches. So this is more in the technical aspects of the food system. We integrated the safe by design approach to invite people 
uh, the players to think about safe by design. I will explain a bit more about that later. And also an important element that we wanted to reach with this game is to make people think about uh, risks for the future. So how to balance different risks that we have regarding the food system for the future. So this is uh, both food safety risks. So if there is, for example, toxic compounds in your foods, it's not safe. It's actually not food. You cannot eat it. Food sustainability. So actually we want to produce food now, but we also want to be able to produce food probably on the same fields in 2100. Um, and the third aspect to balance is also resilience because the food system, as we probably all know, faces shocks from climate change, from weather, from societal changes. So we want our fut future food system to be resilient. And these three aspects need to be in balance. So that was how we set off to create this board game. Here you can actually see a glimpse of the board. This is the playing board. And this game was not just a bit bullshitting around, but the game elements were actually based on science. So we set out to different experts from the food system from Wageningen University, and they contributed scientific game elements about the food system. How are interactions there? What can happen? Um, and players can play around. And then the game takes a safe by design approach, and this means the players think in advance on the balance in their food system, what they, they are creating. You see here in the middle this planet. This is a future planet where you can build yourself a future food system. And you have to balance these three aspects. So you have to think on the balance between resilience, food safety, and also safety for the environment. But safe by design doesn't only mean you think in advance uh, on a balance, but you also need to think with everybody. So it's not thinking alone, for example, by a food company, but it's thinking with all stakeholders in advance and during the process on this design safe approach. So this is in research, in the research phase, but also in innovation by companies in the surrounding legal framework of the food system and also in policy decision making. And we facilitate this way of thinking in the game uh, by offering an extra possibility. So it's possible to play this game as yourself, but it's also possible to do a role play and pick a role. So for example, you could be a sustainable farmer that has a family business and he wants to stay farming for many generations because he wants to give his fields to his grandchildren, for example. Or you could maybe play as a greedy manager of a very large company that wants only profit in the short term. And then you can play around with these roles and see how that is going if you put them together in a group, building a food system. Um, yeah, so then in the end, there will be a winner from this game. And of course, the goal would be ideally to end hunger. So you could say maybe the one who produced the most food wins, but actually in this game you will see that there is also other tac tactics that can maybe make you in winning. And it's all about this balancing and stakeholders. Safe by design approach. And then the game goes together with an inquiry. So after playing, uh, the players collect together insights, dilemmas that they encountered, and also the strategic choices that they made to win. So after the game playing as a group, you have a common ground to proceed further in your thinking on the future food system. Um, so before I proceed to my team members with sharing you some insights from the game playing, I will first show you a short movie with some photos on the game playing events that we had and on the game, so you can have a bit of impression on uh, how this looks like. Okay, uh, hello, good morning. I'm Marta Rodriguez uh, from uh, Wageningen Food and Biobased Research. And together with Mirta, uh, I was responsible of uh, the game playing in the Netherlands. Also, 
I contributed to, to the game elements as a sustainability uh, uh, expert in food processing. Yes, and here, well, we had um, a composition of policymakers, food industry, researchers, and also a representative of consumers. And there, well, we tried to give some spice to the game uh, by making a role uh, playing and then offering a bit of a hetero heterogeneity uh, across teams and also within the teams. So we, try, we make sure that uh, in every uh, game table we had also different uh, composition to, to kind of have different discussions in the end. And within uh, these teams, well, as uh, Esmer explained, uh, we, we try to have like um, um, different, like extremes, no, between uh, sustainable and resilient, um, yeah, searching people to a more uh, co conservative and, and more uh, looking only to profit. And that will lead us to uh, different insights of the game. Uh, we had we we experienced like real life um, uh, like challenges and dilemmas with different stakeholder interests, as you can imagine, and for decision making, which was because different stakeholders also have um, different um, investment resources and and interests, and this was a disadvantage sometimes to the people that didn't have uh, enough. Um, yeah, investments made, which were making uh, decisions a bit more difficult. Then uh, there's also the future of uncertainty. Um, future uncertainty uh, because then you don't know up, up front uh, what disasters will come. So the, in the game, there is this, um, a moment where you have uh, disasters or, or out of control cards uh, that bring this element of uh, uncertainty and and also a bit kind of challenging and testing what the, the resilient investments uh, the teams have made. And here, of course, they need to come. There are moments where they need to invest and come to an agreement. Uh, so then, in, in retrospect, we, we uh, found that to address this need versus unpredictability, uh, it's quite uh, difficult. And what to prioritize? No? So do, you want, do you want to prioritize uh, sustainability prior, uh, or uh, profit? And of course, this team needs to come to a decision together. And in the end, well, we figured out that it needs to be a healthy balance uh, between these two, um, and to make, yeah, to have a, also a resilient, low-impact food. And it needs to be a good collaboration uh, with across stakeholders, uh, and have to have a, also more holistic approach. And I think this was really we, we experienced that this is really like a a, a real. Uh, like a test from reality, and it's a good way to kind of put in other people's shoes. And so I think it, it could be uh, a good start for for stakeholders to to challenge each other. And now I pass the to Catherine. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Lagan. I'm in the Knowledge, Technology, and Innovation Group here at Wageningen in the Social Sciences. So I had the pleasure of getting to go to Indonesia and run a game-playing workshop. And I, I ran this workshop in Bandung, Indonesia, and I worked a little bit with some collaborators as well in, um, at uh, ITB, the Institute Technology Bandung, one of the national universities there. And um, we ran these workshops, and the workshops included some urban farmers uh, some PhD candidates, and also a few members of the regional government who came and played the game with us as well. And we, uh, we also had these sort of mixed tables where we played the game, and what we did is we played the game first, and we talked a little bit about uh, some of the technical elements of the game and, and what we thought about them, and then we had a larger debrief at the end of the game where we talked a little bit more expansively about the game and, and how they experienced the game and what they thought about it. And some of the things that we found, um, so some of these um, technical aspects were really interesting to talk about. So, for example, within the game, we have these cards, these resource cards like soil, water, um, but there's also food. And what happens when you run out of cards? So if you're designing the game, should you make it a limited number of cards? And what are the sort of effects of having a certain number of cards, limiting those cards? And um, how do you sort of work through those finite resources? Uh, and initially, I thought, oh, you run out of cards. We'll give you some more to make it you know, fun to play the game. 
And some of the people that we played with said, no, actually, it's much more interesting if we have fewer cards. So that was quite interesting. Um, we also had this scenario where sometimes you would have these out-of-control cards, and you would have to pay something like a, a certain number of environmental cards that you had invested in sort of your uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and sometimes people wouldn't have enough to pay. And we said, what do you do? Do you carry that debt, or should we just sort of wipe the slate clean? And this was also a really interesting conversation about what happens in real life if, you, if you're unable to sort of um, pay for these, these uncertain risks, these things that you have no control over, what should be the effects? Uh, and we had some interesting conversations as well about the role of government in those kinds of scenarios or more sort of collabor collaborative relationships between the players of the game. Um, because, of course, in, in our, our kind of uh, bigger debrief at the end of the game playing exercise, we said, you know, really, you're not necessarily completely on your own. And so we had some reflections about the broader environment, the social con context, the institutional environment in which people make decisions about how they're going to invest in their farms. And so we said, you know, in real life, perhaps, you know, you're hit with a risk and you can collaborate with your neighbor. You can work with the other farmers in your region about how to, how to um, alleviate some of those effects. So how do, you, how do you design a game and what does that reflect in terms of what happens in reality? Um, and then we also talked a little bit about the context of playing the game in Indonesia. What's different about this environment? And when we look at these out of control cards, these things that happen, uh, how is that magnitude different um, based on the kind of local context? Um, how does you know, contamination affect the soil differently in Indonesia than it would, say, in the Netherlands? So we had these sort of broader conversations, some of them about these technical aspects of the game, some about the, the broader context. And one of the things that we really enjoyed was reflecting on the use of the game as a methodology to, to explore these things with different people, different farmers, um, and different stakeholders across these contexts that can be quite different as well. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Simon, and uh, I am a VWO 5 student at uh, the Marnix College, which is a secondary school nearby. And uh, last week, me and Floris uh, hosted this game at our school with a, um, a group of pupils also in VWO 5, ranging from the ages of 15 to 17 years old. Uh, we started off this game by uh, simply giving a brief overview about what the project was uh, in order to uh, generate some enthusiasm for the pupils. Uh, because it's such a serious issue brought down to uh, a board game. Um, so we had to make sure everybody was in on it and everybody took the game serious, which went very well. Uh, at the end of the game, we had a group discussion uh, where we also discussed some insights, and these insights were based on uh, their visions for the future. Uh, so apparently, uh, the pupils uh, we had played our game put emphasis on the efficiency um, uh, while producing different foods. Uh, also, the balance between food safety, uh, resilience, and environmental safety, and being short of the needed resources. So when someone is short, another player uh, or another country um, has to be able to help and also uh, trade resources with the country that is short um, uh, yeah, on, their, on their needs. Um, we also had the pupils fill in a survey um, uh, based on um, how they experienced playing the game. Because of their ages, uh, we were quite worried if they would take the game serious. In, um, but that went very well. Uh, they found it enjoyable to uh, discuss a serious issue uh, yeah, based on something fun, well, with something fun, in this case, the board game. So yeah, that went great. sharing some insights about previous groups who played this game. But of course, I also have some uh, dilemmas about the food system, future food system for you here today. So it's your time now to think on some uh, dilemmas on a safe by design approach and on balancing food safety, environmental safety and resilience. So I would invite you to scan the QR code. I'll give you some time to load uh, the quiz.
things. Yeah, you can also enter on the top. You can go to menti.com, menti.com, and then you can enter the code. You can also enter. You can enter with a smartphone or also with another device uh, in that way. I see the first people are in. I can see it. Some people press the thumb up there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are you in? Do you need some time? Okay, so I have the first question uh, for you. I will first talk you a bit through the question because it's a lot of text and then give you a moment to think and afterwards we will make a voting on this dilemma. So actually now today you are all a farmer. You are a farmer and you are offered to obtain an organic certification for your farm. And this organic certification means you will appeal to conscious consumers and also it's good for remediation of your soil. So it has two advantages. But then the question of you is to you is will you obtain the certification? And similarly as in the game, I offered you a choice. Yes, I will obtain the certification or no, I will not obtain the certification. But every choice goes with a certain reward and a certain cost based on science. So in case you vote yes, you, will, you as a farmer will get this organic certification. You get as a reward that your soil quality and your production level of your farm are stable until the year 2100. But it will also have a cost. So this year, actually because of all the investments, you will only have half the pro profit. And in your case, it means actually you and your family will live below the poverty line this year. So it means actually you don't have enough, enough food for yourself this year. So that's you can also choose not to do this. And your reward will be that you can invest in other things. So you will have a double profit this year in 2024, which means you can invest in new products and innovations for your farm, which is also good. But your cost will be for 2100. So your soil quality, in case you vote no, will be very poor in 2100. Only half the amount of food can be produced on your land, which means the future farmers which may be the, your gen grandchildren or the generation of your grandchildren, will live below the poverty line. So they will be hungry, actually. So you can think about on this dilemma. Will you obtain the certification? Yes or no? Yeah, you can vote now. Interesting to see. So we have a kind of majority for the people who are long-term thinkers here. They accept that their family is hungry this year. Thanks. Is there someone who wants to say something on their answer? What are you, maybe? Yeah, go ahead. Ah, I'm not sure. Can we give him... Ah, we have it here. Yeah. <laughs> A lot. I'm a uh, one person who chooses uh, B uh, because um, I, I think it's true that in uh, 2100 the soil would be very poor. Uh, but another consideration is that uh, we, we, we do not know what the future would bring. For example, uh, 100 years ago, we might uh, not think of that. Uh, uh, the, um, ammonia synthesis could help to make uh, so much food available. So we, we, we would be confident about uh, the new technology in uh, 2100. Maybe we, we will no longer be so reliant on the soil. Yes, thanks. Very nice addition. So this is actually dealing with this future uncertainty as well. Like you don't really know what will happen in the future. Thanks. Very interesting. So we have a next question of you. You're not a farmer anymore. You're now all a manager of a large food retailer. And you have actually made a good profit. So you can invest. And the choice is what are you going to invest in? So you're either going to invest in a digital information management system for food traceability and transparency. 
So this is a system that will give you a reward, and it means in the future, in 2100, you will have only half the foodborne illnesses. So it means really little people get sick from eating because you have this management system to tra track that. So it means improved health, improved health in 2100. But the cost will be also that food prices increase now. Because of this investment, the food price uh, increased in 2024, which means there is more hunger now. But you can also choose to not do this and invest in your food as usual. So you keep a manual record keeping of safety and traceability with a higher error rate. So your reward will be that your food prices say stay stable now. So there's less hunger this year. But the double amount of people get sick from food, so foodborne illnesses in 2100. There's a lot of food safety risks going on, which means a decreased health in 2100. So you can either choose to invest in a digital information management system now, or invest in other things, uh, but accept a higher amount of food illnesses in the future. You can choose what you... Thank you, very interesting. So many people actually think on the future to have less diseases from food then and accept a higher price now. I think for the sake of time, I will not go into detail now and go to the last question of the quiz, maybe. Uh, so the last question for you today is what do you really want to see in the food system of 2100 that we don't fully have now, and we ask that also to all the players of the game, so we have answers to that. And it's an open question, so you can actually type what you think from maybe your profession or your personality, what is the most important thing of the food system of 2100 that we don't fully have now. And if you like, you can actually also put multiple answers if there is multiple things that you think we should have for the food system. Yes, I see some things that are broader than the food system, justice, anti-colonization. And I also see some very specific technical aspects, starch synthesis. Nice. Resilience is very big now. It means multiple people put it. I see circularity popping up. Circularity is something that we didn't explicitly address in the game because the game could be applicable to any food system. But of course, this is also very relevant. Thank you. I think we'll close the quiz now. We'll keep the answers also uh, as a briefing of this meeting. Maybe we can go back to the PowerPoint. Yes. So in case you would be interested to learn more about this and also play the game uh, yourself, there's actually an opportunity today for game playing uh, with our team. You can take in the coffee break uh, that's following after the next presentations a green ticket in the registration desk. We have 24 tickets because we can have a group of 24 people playing this game. And you can come to the room here that's called Quantum 2 at 12.35, so it's, uh, you have five minutes to uh, take and bring some food to there, and you can eat there and play the game with us. You can pick a role and uh, develop your own vision for the fut future food system. And of course, we are also not st sitting still now as a project team, so we have a future for this game. It will be available for non-commercial purposes for borrowing, so you can contact me, you can borrow some game boards for your group of interest. We have planned some empty sessions, some gifts with this game, and also uh, Wageningen Pre-University, so it's the people from the university that have the contacts with the schools. They will uh, include this game in their uh, education program, so that's very nice. And in case you have further questions or you have interested to work with this game, you can uh, contact me. So I would like to say thanks a lot for the whole team who's here today, and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you.
Great. Thanks so much, Esme and team. Um, so as Esme mentioned, if you want to get up close with the game um, and play it yourself, um, please grab a green ticket um, and head down to the quantum rooms uh, downstairs during lunch. So we've talked a bit about land food systems, but now it's time to dive into the ocean um, and talk about marine food systems. So we have Luke here, uh, who is a senior researcher from Wageningen Marine Research, who's going to take us through with his team. Um, and um, he's actually going to inspire us on behalf of the team um, to actually look at the outcomes um, that uh, search for major dilemmas in the marine food system. So his presentation will give some insights um, into some of the choices that really need to be made today in terms of marine food systems. So if I can welcome Luke and the team to the stage. Thanks. No, Luke's just doing it on his own. Here you go. Here's your clicker. And the mic. Thanks very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. No, we do that again. Ladies and gentlemen, or whatever you identify yourself with, good morning, and then you go, oh, good morning, Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, let me shortly introduce the members of the team that are currently here. We have way more members, but they had other business to do. Please, Marnix, Ingrid, and Menno, where are you? Please stand up. Please stand up. There's Menno. <coughs> As you can see, I have the microphone, I have the clicker, I have about 278 slides and about 30 minutes, and I'm fully aware that I'm the one standing between you and coffee break. Right? So if I ask you to interact, please interact quickly so we can get to coffee quickly. All right? Okay. Imagine Marine Food Systems 2100. Um, you may not know this, but you should. 70% of this world is ocean. So the one who named this planet Earth made a slight boo-boo. If you look from space to Earth, it's the blue marble, right? It's not a bunch of dirt we're living in. Um, it, has, it fosters about 80% of all life on Earth. We get about 15% of all our, um, <coughs> all our proteins we get from the ocean, but only 4% of our food stems from the ocean. So that means there's, there's quite a vast area where we can still do things, right? And, and keep in mind that everything you do at sea, you can free up land, which is valuable and really getting scarce. And you also know everything you do with salt water, you can fresh up the freshwater resources that we already know that are very, very scarce. So that was our starting point. And then... Um, Seema was so kind to uh, grant us our project. So we would go into what kind of marine food system are we really looking forward by 2100? And actually, you will note that a lot of the things I'm going to tell you is basically based on copy from Esmo's presentation because we were having same thoughts about let's put up a game, play a game with people, and then see where we end up. So... We will try to look forward, open our eyes, and then see what we have to do today, or to put it in our... Oh, yes. So, we found some inspiration in the fact of let's build a game. So popular these days. And we used the, the food systems approach, because we're from Wageningen, so that's what you do, right? And we used the future method, which is one of those scenarios, future-looking exercises, uh, which is actually... I find very interesting because what you try to do is you try to build future worlds. And then you can choose from the different worlds whether you want to be there or not. Okay? And for those of you uh, who are on Netflix, there's a nice series called Outlander, which has a main character that is basically time traveling. And, and the, the main message from there is that she travels back in time and learns things and travels to the future and learns things. And that is basically what we will try to do with you. We will invite you to be a time traveler and look in the worlds of 2100 and see whether we like it or not. Okay? Ready to travel? Ah, you're warming up to it. Good. All right. So, on our route to the future, what are the drivers? 
Is there anybody here who knows what a driver is? Or is there anybody who doesn't know what a driver is? Please stand up. Please stand up. You're either completely lost or you don't want to talk to me. Is there anybody who knows what a driver is? Yeah? Who said yes? Raise your hand. Who said yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm making it for myself, but... Like a driver of change. So, like, um, like, I don't know, is hunger, like, the need for something different cause that causes change? Really? You, you, you know, in, in, in any system, you can see there's a lot of variables in that system. But some of those variables are more equal than others. Those are the variables that are really pushing the system into a certain direction. Now that is what we are calling the drivers. So we were going to look at, if we talk about the marine food system in 2100, what are the most important variables that we know that are pushing a system in a certain direction? Now I'm not going to go through this, but this is just, uh, we, we had help of an ACT team of very, very, very capable students who really, really worked very hard to, to develop this system. And this is just an overview of what you basically see in the yellow are, the, let's say, the subsystems. So there's a part for nature, for economics, for the social political world. And the two main drivers in that area are being defined. Okay. And then um, we asked the team, can you also build scenarios? And, and I told them, you know, usually people come up with four scenarios. Why do they come up with four scenarios? Because they have options. Yeah, but then why don't they do five? Or three? Because they like even numbers. Uh -huh. and, the, and they like the X and the Y axis, right? So that's, let's do four. So I told them, well, be a little bit creative. Don't do four. Do three. Do five. But I told you, that was a hard-working bunch of people. So they came up with 12. Which is like, no way you can work with that. So we still have a lot of work to do ourselves to limit the number of, of scenarios. But they had really, really been working hard to combine all those drivers, create different visions of the world. And that means that we have different outlooks on how the world in 2100 can look like. A short reminder, why 2100? Because it was in the assignment. No, the other important thing is you have to think way ahead. Can you think back 30 years? Some of you can't because you were not even born. Some of my age should be able to. <laughs> think of what was the mobile device of a telephone 30 years ago. It was just a long extension cord, right? We didn't have electric cars. So if you th think 30 years ahead, you have no clue what will happen. It's basically what the answer was also given about the soil. On the one hand, I find it scary if we trust that technology will help. On the other hand, we have no clue what we can do over the, the next couple of uh, decades. Okay, so think way ahead. So we have no clue what really will be happening. And so they constructed scenarios and they did a very nice new technology thing. They fed the text of the scenario into AI and AI generated images. Like this one. If you see this image and you like this world, stand up. Come on, you lazy. Jeez. Or you don't like this world. No? This, this, is, this is really a big no, 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 <laughs> no, okay, wow, <laughs> so much for democracy. <laughs> All right, in this world, rich people eat nice food, poor people eat uh, less nice food, <laughs> but there is international cooperation. We are working together with the rest of the world. We have mitigated climate change. 
but yeah, in that process, we lost a lot of our wildlife. So a lot is under control, and, and okay, and uh, there's a high migration between European countries. So you will see in all of those scenarios, there are some really good things. Well, there are some good things, and there are some really, really bad things. Okay. Now, if you're not happy with this world, how about this one? You should have voted for the last one, right? <laughs> now you're really fucked. This is the world that you end up in. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's not enough food. Uh, and, and basically what we do as Fortress Europe, we start recolonizing the rest of the world. We still think we can do that. But honestly, we can't, right? We're outcompeted by the Chinese and, uh, <coughs> and Russia and stuff like that. Anyway, so we have a problem with food. Um, basically, our society is driven by uh, corporations, right? Do away with government, just have corporations that produce, they rule the world. And, uh, well, as you can tell from the picture, we didn't manage to fight climate change and wildlife. Who needs wildlife when you can eat soil and green? That's another reference for people my age. <laughs> okay, how about this one? If you like it, stand up. You hippies. <laughs> really. <laughs> Call something flower power and you're happy. <laughs> All right. Um, well, maybe you're right. Um, <clears throat> in this world, we have a very, very strong control over food production. We have diverse uh, diets and sustainability is deemed to be very, 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 very important. So that also means that you are reducing production to what the carrying capacity of your system is, if at all we would know. Um, Europe is really united and they are working together with the rest of the world. Uh, and of course, climate change decreased and blah, blah, the, a happy world, right? Bob Ross, happy world. Um, okay. Then, what do you think of this one? You like it? If you like it, stand up. Uh, see some doubt. Also see some lazy people that never want to stand up. All right, thank you. This is a world in which we have full control over everything. We, um, <coughs> we have experts leading everything. Government, production, just leave it to the expert. Basically, leave it to us people. We know what's best for the world, right? <laughs> Food is homogeneous. I mean, it's, again, soil and green. You don't die. It doesn't taste well, but you don't die. And um, we have managed to, uh, to change climate change, but as you can see, everything is under control. There's no more nature. It's really like all production driven. Okay. Now, these are just four out of the 12 worlds that we just picked for illustration. But if you like, during lunchtime, we also will be downstairs where you can play the game with us. Um, okay. So now you have these different worlds. And what the future technique really requires you to do is imagine you really live in this world. Don't think how you ended up there. This is just the world you're living in. And when you look around, do you like it? Do you not like it? And that is the moment that you also start coming back to today. Because you have the big question, do we want to get to that world? And if so, how are we going to get there in that flower power era? Or do we want to avoid ending up in that world? And then what do we have to do today? to make sure that we don't end up in that world. Something you ate? <laughs> All right, so basically it's, it's about five areas that, that we were looking at. Consumption, spatial planning, global complexity, production, and food policy. So that's, that's even, those are the, the Uber drivers. That's the areas we really trying to tweak, and, and as you will understand, this is an abbreviated form of what, what of course, is, is, uh, is all in there. Um, <clears throat> so, consumption, 
and especially in the marine world, one of the main questions is, do we go high trophic, do we go low trophic? If you go low trophic, you can think of uh, algae. Did you know? Fact, for real. Must be, it's a fact. Not an alternative fact, it's a real fact. If you take 4% of our ocean, that's a vast area, but it's only 4% of the ocean. If you would use that to uh, cultivate macroalgae, you would be able to produce enough fatty acids to feed the entire world population of 2050, which is estimated to be about 10 billion people, and provide them with all the necessary fatty acids. Soil and green, it tastes like shit, but it can, <laughs> you can do that, right? So just an idea. So the question is, do you want to eat fish, which is high trophic, or do we go for mussels and oysters? Those are choices you have to make. <coughs> And, and then the big question also is how do you weigh the different types of food? Remember this one world where rich people were basically eating fish and the poor people were eating bimarine? It was a pleasure. <laughs> you don't have to. No. Does it sound that bad? <laughs> okay, just strike a balance between what you want to, uh, want to produce. Then for spatial planning, actually, it's the same thing. What do we want to do out at sea? And when we started out, right, we noted everything you do out at sea frees up space on land, which might be a, a good idea. Um, and also, uh, how do you strike a balance between preserving natural resources and exploiting natural resources to give you a nice thing to dwell upon over your cup of coffee? If you have a very rich spot in the marine environment, and a nutritionist lower fertile spot. Where would you put your production? Do you put the production in the highly productive area, so you only need a small area to put all your production? Or do you leave that area to the natural environment to flourish, and we produce in the lower nutrition area? Think about it over coffee. I just ruined your coffee. <clears throat> okay, then we come to global complexity. Main issue is, are we part of a global world? Trade, uh, share resources, or do we go for self-sufficiency? Um, we know globalization and international trade was believed to be something very, very nice and helpful. Until, well, actually both China and Russia said, well, uh -huh, trade, but we're not friends. Um, so the, the big dilemma here is, if we are self-sufficient, we are relying on ourselves. So that means that we have more control. On the other hand, it means that you lack the resources of the rest of the world. So that is, again, one of those dilemmas that you have to take into consideration. Uh, production, you, you can think about, do we do aqu aquaculture or fisheries? And when you think aquaculture, a lot of aquaculture is ag actually agriculture at sea. Um, <clears throat> you, you have to, to find a balance there. And also the competition with other uh, ways of using our seas. If you look at the Netherlands, basically food production is the lowest priority in the whole array of things that we think we should be doing at the North Sea. Think about the wind farms. Yes, we need that because we need renewable energy. But we need gravel extraction because ah, we're losing the fight against the sea, so we need to build higher dikes and things like that. So a lot of things have been given priority over food production. And then there's also the dilemma of food policy or a general po the governance issue. Do we need very strict rules or do we believe that people can change and they will automatically do the thing that is good. Um, more policies do not automatically mean that people will adhere to them. I would actually say the opposite. The more policies that are needed, it basically looks like people really want to do something else. <clears throat> and also, do we manage to get a new management practice and, and will people really change in their behavior or will they stick with where they are now? So these are all the things that we keep in mind and then we step forward to playing the game. Um, what we will do, we will take you to a future world. As I said, you have to live in that future world and you can take different roles. You can be a consumer, you can be a resource manager, 
You can be a fish. You can be somebody living in another part of the world. And that is, that is very much what, what was in your presentation as well, right? That, that, you, that you try to, by taking on different roles, you see what are the different perspectives of the different uh, characters in that world. Now, we also have different worlds. So you can also, with your one character, you can step in different worlds and see what suits best to, uh, to your role. Um, and then in the final analysis, it's, it's like, what actions do we plan for today? Because that's what it really is about, right? It's nice getting paintings of how 2100 can look like. But the basic thing is, what kind of marine food system will we leave to our children? And the biggest thing is, let's talk. We really need to talk about it. And see where we will end up and what we can and should do today. But game is still under construction. Uh, Marnix, can you show? Actually, our students. Run! Run, Marnix, run! <laughs> Actually, our students made the first version of the board game. It really is a board game, it comes in a box. <laughs> Santa Claus is early this year. <laughs> We've got events, we've got stakeholders, we've got worlds, and also we have a lot of discussion uh, cards. Thank you. But it's still not finalized. We, we're still working with 12 worlds, which is way too many, so we have to scale it down. The narrative of the stories that are given to you, we have to brush up on that. So we are actually looking for somebody who has a lot of money to allow us to do a second step. And then we can really produce this board game, which will be a success. Uh, well, aren't you the sharks? <laughs> okay. But for you today, we brought our time capsule. We brought it downstairs. It's there. It's really there. It's true. It's the best time capsule ever. It's there in that room. So we ask you, come with us. Then we can give you four destinations where you can explore what the worlds will be looking like and what will be the consequences for us today. Now, the question is, are you brave enough to become a traveler? Looking forward to see you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. There's a bit of competition here between the two games, I see. Um, and it, it seems like at Wageningen everybody's just playing games, um, which is kind of nice, because uh, you would expect an academic institution maybe not to be playing so many games. Um, so, um, as Luke mentioned, uh, you can uh, go to the registration desk and grab a card. So similar to Esme's team where you grab a green card if you want to play that game, you grab a blue card if you want to dive into the ocean. So you cannot play both. So if you do want to talk with both teams, try to utilise the network break that we have coming up soon um, uh, to, to chat with them. So it works in the same way. Grab a card, grab your lunch, and head down to the quantum rooms at lunchtime. So um, Luke told some fibs, um, and he said that the coffee break was next, but it's actually not. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it, it, it's coming. Um, but we're actually going to shift gears a little bit. So we've just had two presentations as part of the KB35 program, and now we're actually shifting gears to the student challenge. Um, and so I would like to welcome back to the stage Miriam, who's going to give us a little bit of background about what this student challenge is all about and what your role is actually in this student challenge and what to expect in the next uh, block. Thanks, Miriam. Well, thank you very much. Um, is it working already? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, we are here with uh, students from the student challenge that are not playing games, right? They are sitting there and there. They are very serious. Although it's, uh, it's been a good example here. I don't want to say that uh, the games are not very interesting, because they are. <laughs> um, so, uh, the Food Systems Innovation Challenge. We will see a trailer uh, after my small talk. But you will see the nine universities uh, um, competing in this, uh, this, you know, uh, this challenge. There are some coordinates also here. Maybe you can stand up. We see here uh, Josef from uh, Iselki USP Brazil uh, University. Maybe there are some students from Wageningen University. Also stand up if you're here, your university. No? 
Okay. Uh, Ethiopia, Wallow University. Then we have uh, Makerere University, Uganda. Vilda is there. Uma from Kathmandu University, Nepal. And, uh, well, there are some other universities, but the coordinates are not present. I'm presenting Wageningen University in Research, of course, for our teams. Um, so what did they do? We will see that in the trailer. With the assignment was that the students would uh, look into their own local context and uh, think of an innovation in food systems. That, so that can be anything. And I will not tell you any examples because we will hear now seven pitches. Uh, half of the group uh, will uh, pitch right now. It's important to say pay attention because we will have an audience award at the end of this whole event at 12.30. So at 12.15 you, uh, you can pick up your phone again and you can vote for one of the teams. Um, yeah, so I think I've said enough. Uh, let's start the video, and then Marie will take over for the for the to introduce all the pitches. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to say also to the students. You, they all have one minute only, so it's very they they've been practicing and practicing. So the the technical crew they will uh, put in a, a, like a time it's like tick 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 tick. So the, and if you hear that, <laughs> you will only have ten seconds left. So. This, this is to add to the whole experience. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. So as uh, Miriam said, we have many teams here representing um, their university. Um, many of them arrived to the Netherlands on Friday. So you can imagine it's exciting, but they're also very nervous. So I would like a lot of energy from you guys. So we're expecting two things from you as the audience. One, your energy and your support, of course, to the teams, and also to keep in mind which team is your favorite, because there will be an audience award, as Miriam mentioned, um, at around 12.30 today. So, uh, and as Miriam mentioned, there will be a timer. So it's intense, and they've only got one minute. Imagine, what can you say in one minute? Not really a lot, so you've really got to listen, and they've been practicing a lot um, for this chance. So our first team is from Ghana. So we're flying to West Africa. So. Can I get a round of applause for our team? Wait, wait, wait. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So. Thanks. So this is from Ghana. We have Rescue Juice Squad Cashew Apple. Take it away. Can you believe that? Cashew apples have five times more vitamin C than oranges. Yet, 90% of cashew apples go to waste every year in Ghana. The cashew industry employs about 300,000 people, 
which is expected to increase to about 800,000 people in 2030. And its yield increasing to about 400,000 metric tons per year, which means even more cashew apples will go to waste. That is why we are here as Rescue Squad. We have created what would have gone to waste into fresh, organic, nutritious juice, which is free from additives and is nutritious, filled with vitamins. We have also trained about 32 individuals on how to produce this juice independently. Can you guess what we are going to use the residues for? We are going to produce cashew jam, cashew powder, cashew syrup, and fruit juice. Thank you. Amazing. So it's not easy to be the first one. So thanks very much for your energy. So we're going from West Africa all the way now to Nepal and transcending from the Himalayas, we have Nepal with EcoGrub. Imagine you are a poultry farm in Nepal, and every year the feed cost rises, making it harder to stay profitable. The major problem is high price of soy milk, which is one of the key protein ingredients for a chicken feed. But what if we could replace that expensive soy milk with a protein so that faster, cheaper, and requires only biodegradable waste? That's where the team EcoGraphs comes in. The best part, we feed black soldier fly larva with the biodegradable waste which reduces both cost and waste at the same time. In Nepal, the price of our product is 45% lower than the normal feed product. So we are Team EcoGrub, who, uh, who is uh, working harder to make changes for Nepali poultry farming. So let's join hand in hand to make changes for them. So yes, EcoGrub, Eco is smart feed for sustainable poultry farming. Thank you, guys. So please be aboard EcoGraph. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. So we are now going to East and Africa. However, our, our team from Kenya won't be able to join us here in person. So we have a video to show uh, for their pitch. So this is the Kenyan team, which is Dryland Agriculture Innovators. Thank you. Away. Have you ever witnessed water scarcity? Farmers in dryland areas are struggling. They are unable to produce crops because of water shortage, which also has an advanced effect on crop yields and soil health, making it even harder for them to reap good harvest in future. Therefore, it is important to find ways to conserve water for minimal rainfall experienced in these regions. By creating little basins where crops can be planted and water harvested, soil health will be promoted and crop yields will increase. If we conserve water and promote soil health, we will promote a sustainable future in Thailand. Great, thanks to our team from Kenya to send, for sending this in. So we're going to, from Kenya to Latin America, and we have a team here from Brazil, uh, Agro Essential. Can I please welcome them to the stage? <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Did you guys know that Brazil is the biggest pesticide user in all over the world? What if I told you that instead of contaminating our crops, we could increase their nutritional value and fight pests at the same time? By using essential oils like delimonene, an extract from orange producers, and monkey pepper oil from uh, the Amazon region, we will not only protect our crops, but we would elevate them. The oils increase the pigment levels in plants. They are precursors of vitamin nutrients, such as vitamin A, and they're responsible for strengthening our immune system. Could you imagine a future where food not only sustains us, but it truly nourishes us? Our method makes uh, nutritious and more sustainable food available, reducing the use of chemicals. This would shift Brazil from being a big 
best-sized user to a leader in sustainability. Join us as we make, as we transform agriculture using nature's own solutions. Thank you. Very nice. Well done. Great. Thanks very much. I didn't know that about Brazil, so thank you for sharing. So we are now flying back to Eastern Africa. So our carbon footprint is really increasing here. And so I would like to invite Success Tribe from Uganda for the next pitch. Take it away. Good luck. Our journey was inspired by this. Our journey, sorry, our journey was inspired by the struggling need to fulfill tuition requirements in our first church university. Picture this. 65 hardworking farmers and vendors in a market, many of whom are women and youth, struggling, watching 32 tons of tomatoes waste away each month. This is due to limited technology, low market access, affecting 35 families, and increasing food insecurity. But Success Tribe has partnered with these vendors, and with targeted trainings and improved infrastructure, we've managed to transform 3.2 tons that would otherwise go to waste into valuable, naturally sweetened tomato products like ketchup, barbecue sauce, jam, sauce, and more. Now imagine expanding this impact to 20 more struggling markets in Kampala. With your support, we can empower local communities, improve food security, and transform lives one market at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing and very uh, nice choice of outfit for the tomato team. <laughs> nice work, nice. So uh, now we're going back to the Americas, um, to Suriname, and I would like to welcome Miraculous Mycelia. <laughs> Round of applause. Thanks, good luck. Hello, everyone. I'm from Miraculous Mycelia from Suriname. Now, in Suriname, there's a district, and in this district, they're burning 53,000 tons of rice husk annually. Of course, this produces carbon dioxide, 22,000 tons of it, but we're here to change that. Our objectives are to turn these rice husk into an ingredient for cultivating mushrooms and use the waste as an environmentally friendly fertilizer. So it will not only reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but it will also act as a sustainable source for boosting the income of farmers. Furthermore, surveys have shown that the youth of Suriname are keen on mushrooms, with more than half of them having an interest in cultivating mushrooms. So our project will not only tackle waste, it will empower farmers, and it will engage youth in food security. So why don't you join us in encouraging the next generation to turn waste into an opportunity for a greener Suriname? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So we're on to our last pitch for this block. So remember, you've seen this would have been the first seven. And after our break, you'll see the next ten. So for the last pitch for this block, I'd like to invite Sesame Nutrigenus from Nigeria. Take it away. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. I love it in pasta, but I also know that it contains a lot of carbohydrates. What if there are other healthier ways to hit pasta? Our food innovation, testing pasta, was inspired by the need to help diabetic patients with limited amounts of food to consume for their social inclusion. Our food products have been tested to be rich in essential and trace elements and also low in glycemic index compared to other pasta products. Our product is feasible because it is practicable and achievable within the constraint of time, energy, resources, and technology. Our product is ecologically feasible because our raw materials are biodegradable, our packaging materials can be recycled, and certain plants can thrive where there are limited amounts of water. Our pasta products can be eaten by diabetic patients, pasta lovers, and whole individuals who seek a healthier alternative. Ladies and gentlemen, we are transforming nutrition today for healthier tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So, amazing. Thank you so much. If I can get another big round of applause for all of our teams.
Great. So now we're going for a break. Um, so there will be uh, coffee, tea, and some snacks outside in the foyer. You will also see that there are some research posters as well, and our teams will be there next to their posters to describe their work. So if you have any questions, please approach them. If you would like to play the game with Esmer or uh, the game with Luke, please grab a card, and that's for lunch. And then we'll be welcoming you back here at 11.15. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back. So if I can have everyone please take your seats. And we'll be continuing this morning's program with uh, the third presentation as part of the KB35 program. Um, so what I would like to introduce to you right now is, as you can see on the stage, a very special performance by uh, Roger, who will introduce the team, Mariana and Federico, and they will be presenting Pockets of Resilient Futures in a Turbulent World. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. My first job is to introduce the team that did all the hard work in preparation of today. Can I invite the Pockets team to just rise to their feet so we can all see you? We have Miranda Mewinson, <laughs> we have Nicole Ariette, we've got Mark, Mariana and Fede. Thank you. What will the future of farming and food look like in the year 2100? I don't know. Maybe you do. But, and maybe if you had asked me this question five years ago, I would have given you a straight answer. I was much more certain five years ago. I probably would have come up with something like this. We've seen pictures like this earlier today. It's almost utopian vision of a world of agriculture that is based on efficiency, based on predictability, on makeability in a stable world. And in fact, it is exactly five years ago that National Geographic, the magazine, dedicated a special called How a Tiny Country Feeds the World. And these are all the pictures they took of farming in the Netherlands that was well on its way to realizing this utopian, makeable food system. But fast forward to the here and now today. And our world has utterly changed. Climate change used to be something that we would find in our models as outcomes, as scenarios. Fast forward to today, and it's here, every day, in the newspapers, everywhere. Food has been weaponized. Energy has been weaponized. And with that, the price of fertilizers. Supply, chain, supply chains have been disrupted on a scale we've never seen before. And farmers are at the forefront of these disruptions, of this new uncertain world. They're the first to feel the consequences. And yet we're asking so much of them, and we're asking more of them every day. It's no surprise then that farmers find themselves with their backs against the wall and are protesting not only in the Netherlands, but the world over. There's also good news. Each day, well, there are around 550, 600 million farmers in the world. Each day, all of them wake up, know that they have to do something new. They have to do something different. They have to try and get ready for the new reality that we live in. And when 550 million people wake up every day trying to think of something new, some of them are bound to succeed. Some of them are bound to find new solutions new ideas, new permutations of their farming systems that none of their peers or us have yet thought about. In our group, we went in search of those farmers. We called them lighthouse farmers. We searched for them all over the world and brought them together in the global network of lighthouse farms. Because they're like beacons on the horizon, shining their light, illuminating 
for pathway, illuminating pathways for others to follow. I'm saying pathways, plural, because we don't need one solution. We need many solutions for different soils, different climates, different cultures, different diets. Together, they show us the mosaic, the variety of solutions that are out there. And we use this as our global classroom and laboratory. We send our students, our PhDs, our researchers, and ourselves to all corners of the world to try and find out, in all their diversity, what are the ingredients that they share in common? What are their ingredients of success? And we do so through academic research. And so far in the form of 14 PhD studies and countless master's studies. To ground our stories in science. But what can that tell us about the future of farming and food in the year 2100? For that we have to, to get a vision of that, we have to leave the world of our models behind, of our equations, of our constraints, of our materials and methods. We have to use our imagination. And who is better placed to imagine that world than our lighthouse farmers themselves? So last August, last month, we brought them together, all of them from all over the world, to our workshop, our pockets workshop in Indonesia, where we asked them, can you imagine for us what this new world will look like? And together we came up with a slightly different vision. This is not a dystopian world. This is the reality that we find ourselves in, but it's also a vision of hope. It is a vision of by the lighthouse farmers, of pockets of resilience in a turbulent world. We're going to demonstrate, share this vision with you through a non-scientific format developed by Fede, Mariana and friends. Can I invite you to the floor to share us with us? Welcome, everybody. We are in the year 2100, where over 10 billion people live on planet Earth. Temperatures have increased by 3 degrees Celsius, leading to unpredictable changes in climate. Wildfires, droughts, and floods are commonplace for the people of this area. Land is a limited and valuable resource, almost as rare as family farms. Most farming is done by robots and managed by few land owners, most of which are supermarket brands. But in a quiet valley surrounded by mountains, there is an old orchard. This farm has been in the family for generations, and they are one of the last family farms in the region. Over the years, they have faced many shocks, while these challenges have led most of the surrounding neighbors to sell their land. These farmers are constantly adapting, which has forced them to be more resilient. Our story <clears throat> starts with a woman farmer taking care of her land. Oh, hello. Welcome to my farm. My family has been farming this land at the foothills of these mountains for many generations. 
What you see around me are a hundred year old orchards which were planted by my great grandparents. While this used to be a quiet area, but with the new high speed rail connecting us to the city, we have more urban people building houses around us. We are lucky to have this plot of land as it is rare, and I know it is my duty to take good care of it so the soil remains fertile and healthy. Everything we do on the farm is with the hope that in the next 100 years, this will remain a fertile plot of land. Together with my family, we grow many kinds of fruits and even dry land rice. My daughter is learning fast how to take care of the farm. I really hope she takes over one day. We live peacefully here, but lately the weather's been acting strange. We've been waiting for rain for months and we haven't seen a single cloud all year. We may soon have to dip into our savings and buy extra irrigation water from the municipality. The farmer, always adapting, anticipating challenges, uh, bring uh, bees to the hillside. <laughs> it's a small change, but it helps the orchard grow. Recently, she has also introduced a few cows. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, they can provide milk, graze between the fruit trees, and add manure, of course. This diversity of products help the farmer to maintain resilience. When one product fails, she has others to lean. <laughs> One day, <clears throat> a salesman with a modern machine visit the orchards. Hi there. Hmm? Hi, hey, you. Hello. Hi. I see you're using some uh, old tools. Well, let me show you this new machine that used AI to prune all of the trees for you. Here it is. No management needed. You know how it's called? This is the eye pruner. Hmm, sounds interesting, but uh, how much does it cost? Come here. <gasps> what? That's more than I make in a year. Yeah, but it saves you so much time and labor costs. Come on. Uh, thanks, but uh, my daughter and I, we like working the land together as a family. We don't need these latest gadgets. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Well, we are now at the kitchen table, back at the farmhouse, and uh, the daughters appear with some news. Mom, hi, Mom. Listen, I'm moving to the city. <gasps> yeah, I, I've got a job there, and there is more for me to do there. But don't worry, I still help with the farm occasionally. The farmer starts thinking, maybe she'll need that machine after all. So, well, she decided to buy it. Hopefully, the investment will pay back in the future. We are now at the delivery point. What is happening? Uh, it's already Monday. The self-driving pickup truck will be coming tomorrow. I need to call the retailer and ask if I can increase the price of my products to make up for the investment in this new machine. The farmer calls the retailer on this device, it's called the holophone, and ring, makes a, ring, ring. a strong case for why the price of her products should be higher. Listen, my farm, it's well known. It's been around for generations. People understand that if I increase the prices, it's for good reason. Well... The retailer listened, but rejected her request. 
He argues that consumers don't care about where their food comes from. Supermarkets from across the country are now getting their products shipped through the flying delivery drones for extremely cheap prices. We are now going back to the farm. <clears throat> back at the farm, the farmer suddenly smell smokes <gasps> and see flames. Oh no, the hillside, it's on fire. The bees, the cows, the fruit trees, the rice. We'll have to buy even more water to put it all out. Mom, it's bad, but we got an insurance. Huh? We will recover. Wow, it's sad. It's sad that our land and trees burned. The trees and the diversity here, they've protected us from these wildfires in the past, but this fire was stronger than we've ever seen before. We are now <clears throat> back in a peaceful place, the kitchen table, and back at home, the farmer daughter has an idea that just might help. Mom, I've talked to my friends in the city. They want to help us. We can sell our product there for a better price at the traditional market. I know, I know, it's, it's a radical idea where people go in person to buy their fruits and vegetables instead of getting them automatically delivered. But to convenience the market to sell your products there, you will need to share our story about what makes us unique. Will you tell our stories? I guess I can do that. You see, it all started with my great-grandmother 100 years ago. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us uh, uh, in this performance. Thank you, Mariana. And uh, now we go back uh, to the presentation and thought was, was introduced to Rohir earlier. As you can see, to create uh, a vision of the future that is so far away and to have the opportunity to build it together with the stakeholders, there is a need of imagination. And to foster this process, there is actually a place already in Wageningen University. And that is the Center for Unusual Collaboration, in which I'm involved on another project. And recently, they've been publishing this article in a nature journal, which entitled, Finding Joy, Creativity, and Meaning Through Unusual Interdisciplinary Collaboration. And that's exactly summarized the process that we went together with our colleagues uh, and the farmers uh, to build together all this project. As you can see, this work was a result of this type of collaboration, where we didn't only cross discipline, linking food processing, uh, farming system, business and economic, but also we worked together with an Indonesian uh, designer, Ryan in this picture, from the Shaman Garage, and the design uh, Twente Lab. And uh, you can see we are definitely having fun building uh, the theater itself together with them, creating these puppets together and testing it. Um, this was uh, the initial state of the project, and then we're going to see step by step how it functions. So how to co-design, how to co-develop together these narratives that feel so far away. So first, day, first we reach out all the farmers from the Lighthouse Farm using a survey, and also we collected their stories and their pictures about the future. Uh, then in the meantime, we designed the puppets together, and we draft the first script that we just play. After that, we went to this workshop in Indonesia in which for five uh, days we worked together uh, visiting farms, visiting farmers, but also having the opportunity to have joy and having this type of exercise together. And we started with a photo gallery in which farmers show the picture of their resilience stories learning from each other what does it mean resilience and what does it mean resilience in 2100. After that, we play the first draft and together with them actually, we create a new script 
the one that we just present. How did it go? Uh, first, we had to define a common framework of understanding. What is resilience? Therefore, we adapted uh, um, a framework that is called ABCD, that is also developed by Miranda and the group. And uh, this gives a very concrete elements that people can discuss and decide together how this will look like. So this framework represents different dimensions of resilience. The first one is about agency, so the capacity that people have to mitigate uh, or respond to a shock. The buffer is to see if there is some fallback uh, to resist this type of shock. Uh, connectivity, how this is connected, the actors, how they are connecting the system or other things that are connected within the system. And then the diversity, which is not only the diversity of production, as we've seen before, but also the, the, the diversity of space and scales. These are some of the pictures that uh, farmers show during the photo gallery, telling their stories of resilience. The first one is in Indonesia, then we went to uh, Brazil, Cuba, and Spain. With these few pictures, you can already see how many different ideas they have around resilience. And some elements might be more important than others in specific context, as just through here mentioned. So briefly, in Indonesia, you have this rice complex system. In Brazil, agroforestry. In Cuba, you have sustainable architecture mixed within the system of the farm. And in Spain, you have regeneration of land. So through this uh, photo gallery, farmers were able to share their realities, discussing concrete um, shocks, but also reflecting on all these years of research together with us, together with Bakken University, with all the PhD that came to visit, and etc. They share the stories in a day um, workshop, and then we reflected again what are the elements of resilience. And again, we bound to this framework. So that also comes useful to think about how a framework is going to help research. Well, it can be a boundary ob object between researchers, but also between researchers and participants. So from the scene, uh, we can imagine uh, that the step A, there was a scene two, in which farmers interact with the retailer, asking to increase the price of the products. Well, this is about agency. Uh, B, the buffer. In scene five, uh, the farmers have an insurance, fortunately, to get the money back after the fire comes. That gives buffer. Uh, then uh, C, the connectivity. Uh, the daughter at the last scene connecting with the local market, as an example. And then D, diversity what we just mentioned before, all the products that Mariana was showing with the bees and the cows. So reflecting to these different elements, we arrive in an evening. It was a long day, right, Mariana? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had had a, a long day where the farmers had already visited many farms and, and discussed together with each other about um, uh, how they want to build this network together. Uh, and we said, okay, we gotta, we gotta still have this workshop. We'll do it in the evening. Um, and it was 9 p.m. still after dinner, and we thought there's no way this is going to be a successful workshop. Uh, but as soon as we presented, um, they got very excited, and like the energy in the room came back in. And suddenly we said, okay, if you'd like, you can um, take this, the draft script that we had performed for them um, and tell us what would you change. To our surprise, one of the things that they wanted to change the most is they said, um, that the, the draft we presented was too um, uh, in the moment. They said, this isn't 2100, this is today. They said, it's going to be even worse in the future. And, and this from farmers, I, I don't know, it surprised me a little bit, but they, they were, they're already thinking about how difficult farming is now, and they know that their next generations are going to have an even more difficult time. Okay. So, so we actually uh, made a lot of changes in terms of the context of the situation, um, made the fires even worse, uh, made the, the population pressure. That was another element that they want us to bring in. They said, look, we're facing already ur urban sprawl, the population uh, coming, uh, land being more scarce and being a, a very difficult thing to access. Uh, so these were a lot of the elements that us, even as, as experts in the food system, uh, might overlook. And this uh, transdisciplinary approach together with the farmers uh, really allowed us to make sure that, um, that we, we were developing this vision together with them. Exactly. So going together in this evening, um, Mariana and I, we presented the first draft. 
and then we end up the script to them. I say, okay, make the changes you want. We want to tell your story more in depth. We want to understand better. Then we included all these uh, elements that we present today. But I we also give them the chance to develop their own uh, puppets. And they come out with very yeah, interesting elements that we try to, to like introduce. The train, the train was also something they, they, uh, they even made a little train and they wanted to bring it into the story. Um, so, so a lot of these elements came from us then watching them create their own puppet show. Yeah. And again, I think the, what we're very proud of this project is also the elements of the joy that comes back in this step in which farmers were really having fun of discussing very heavy Serious issues. Serious things, yeah. And uh, having them done that after they had the chance, of course, to cut their own puppets and then they were brave enough actually to play it for us. And after that, of course, we had the debriefing, which is one of the most important steps in this participatory research, reflecting on, okay, what did we learn? What is the take-home message from this scene? Yeah. And they, of course, appreciated how this moment of joy was there. But also, this is a perfect setup for developing further projects, of developing together a research agenda, for instance, in the coming years. And this helps not only to have a background of deciding what does it mean resilience, what is this vision of the future, but also to then have a long-term trajectory of working together with joy, which is actually what we aim in our, in our relation within our researcher and within other partners. So we want to uh, invite all of you uh, during lunch break. They will be in the main corridors. You will find our theater, you will find a script, and if you wish, you can also cut your own puppets or you can try it out. And we also ask more questions for you. <laughs> um, before to jump into the names also, our project is called Pockets. Why is it called Pockets, Mariana? Um, there's, besides the fact that we find these small pockets of the future everywhere in the world, like the lighthouse farms, um, we also wanted to create a tool that could fit inside of a small suitcase um, and that we could actually send with the farmers, with the lighthouse farmers all over the world. So it's something that they can use. This can be translated in any language. Um, that's also the beauty of this uh, type of tool. There's no text associated with it. So you can easily take it and, and use it with, with children, with adults, uh, with everybody in, in any language, in any context. Make your own puppets to reflect uh, your own, their own stories. Um, so we're very excited that um, we'll be able to share this with the Lighthouse Farmers. Um, uh, there's a, a plan already to send it to Spain uh, next. Uh, they've already asked it for November to use it as a tool themselves. Um, so, so we hope that that's the legacy that um, this project uh, is able to have, uh, to be able to continue building narratives and visions. Um, this type of storytelling technique is ancient, and it's, all, it's, it's not static. It's, it's always evolving depending on the context. That's the beauty of storytelling, uh, and that's what we hope that this um, tool can continue to provide. Yeah, exactly. So building up on that, uh, oh, you're also welcome if you want to explore more and to use this tool to contact us. Yeah. Uh, so there is, the, there is the email. But also, indeed, the, the thinking that storytelling is something that really ground in many cultures and it can link somehow. So if you look at the example in Indonesia, we picked it because we want to have an interactive tool to explore these visions. And therefore, we got inspiration from the Wayang Shadow Puppets Theater. But this can also be found in Europe, also in Africa, and in Latin America. It's a very common way to tell stories and imagine something far away in the future. So I want to thank, uh, of course, the member of the team that before we introduced, uh, but also Pablo and uh, Ryan. <coughs> they were two brave designers that worked with us. Uh, they have their own studio. It's called Shaman Garage. And they are based in the Design Lab Twente in Twente University. And uh, I get in touch with them because I coordinate a hub in uh, Wageningen. It's called the Wur Games Hub, where I link different researchers and educators who use serious games. Um, yeah, creativity enough, we didn't go for a board game this time, but it was a very uh, unexplored field to, to explore with my, yeah, with my team and the Lighthouse Farms network. And uh, yeah, saying that, I want to thank you again, the KB35, to be uh, so brave in allowing us to try something very unusual like this Shadow Puppets Theater. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So, uh, thank you very much. What a beautiful and creative way to be able to translate research and involve others in research as well. Um, so, thanks very much. And as the team mentioned, uh, you can speak with them during the lunch break. They'll be in the corridor and you can see the puppets up close. So, as you can see, we have quite a lot of talent within Wageningen University in research. And, of course, for our KB35 project team, it was quite difficult to choose just three teams to recognise and support. So, in the next uh, section, we have three other teams who received recognition and funding for their work. Uh, they'll be presenting a short um, uh, presentation on their, on their research. So the first team I'd like to introduce um, is Winnie, Joyce, Miri and Jan. There'll be also there are two other team members who can't be here today, Alwyn and Ollie. So the team is also joined by Fred, uh, who is a storyteller. So uh, quite similar to our previous presentation as well on how storytelling can really tell the story of our research. So the team will present a world of exchange 2100. My Cell and Networked Place-Based Communities, a Story of Hope and Resilient Communities. Thanks. Yes. The Club of, Club of Rome in 1967, next to 1970, was right. And the joint efforts to reduce carbon dioxide emissions have failed. So now we live a climate that's unpredictable and uncontrollable. Some places are too dry, other places are flooded, other places have continuous rains, there's rising of the sea level. And the old ways of providing food were insufficient. So we fled. All over the world in, in groups, we were going and in search of grounds that were safe. And, and there we rooted. And we called ourselves place-based communities. It's like the examples of the 21st century, the lighthouse farms, the Heerboer, uh, ecological living and building. And one of the main characters of being uh, this community is the notion of presumership. We presumers do not live or uh, work on the agriculture, or not all of them, but most of them are. But we are deeply involved in discussions about how we will use the scantily usable ground we have. So we discuss living, we discuss work, we discuss agriculture and how we preserve nature to live on. We deeply depend on each other. We also have new forms of decision-making. As place-based communities, we are not only working with ourselves, on the contrary, we understand the implications of a change in nature and climate. We know our common interests and needs. So there is a vast and strong and flexible network with which we communicate, not only with other communities, but over borders, worldwide, if necessary. It's like the intricate 
root systems of plants and, and trees, how they communicate. We communicate questions. It nurtures us in, in finding solutions to our problems. It nurtures us also in good ideas and information. And it helps us to live a sustainable way of living. What about the role of government? What about competition? Will nature come first? We don't have a game, but we do have a poster. And if you want to investigate with us the conditions and the possibilities of this kind of scenario, in working in this kind of scenario, we invite you to discuss this with uh, Mr. Poster and uh, during lunch. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much. That's a very nice way to also translate uh, research um, and communicate research. So next we have a video, um, and the video is called Dome, Sweet Dome, and you may have also seen the poster outside of this research. So uh, this team is represented by Annaline and Elias, who are in the audience today. Um, so if you would like to speak with them, um, they are also here. So I'd like to make a special mention to also Luke and Joseph, who produced the video. So the team took a different approach, and they focus on the needs of the food system, considering human health, different cultures, and, of course, the environmental conditions. Their movie of Dome Sweet Dome presents this project idea. Thank you. There's a popular saying that society grows great when people plant trees in whose shade they will never sit. Well, it's probably time to talk not just about trees, but all food systems for the next century. Currently, we grow all of our food in open fields, in plastic tunnels, glass greenhouses, or in closed systems. This food is then shipped across the world via truck, boat, or aeroplane. All food production requires the right amount of sunlight, temperature, water, and nutrients. But in 2100, this may become increasingly difficult. Climate change will result in more extreme temperatures, storms, droughts, and nutrient depletion. So what will we need to do to feed the generations of the future? Our current food production systems will need to protect themselves from this future climate. In the past, we may have naturally had the right conditions above and below ground to grow our food. But as time moves on, the climate above ground will become increasingly harsh, and soil quality will continue to deteriorate, putting our global food production at risk. So we'll need to protect our crops from climate change. Our food production system will have to ensure optimal conditions above and below ground across the world. This is only half the picture. We also need to design food systems around the consumer, around you. What type of food will you need to remain healthy at every age? And on the other side, what does food mean to you and your culture? A varied diet helps. You may have a favorite food, but can you imagine having to eat it every single day? In short, each part of our world comes with its own challenges for water, soil, climate, and culture. We aim to develop a food system that tailors to local environmental conditions while providing a healthy diet and also preserving local customs. And of course, we should never stop planting trees, but we need to adapt to our changing world before it's too late. So now it's time to start building food systems whose food we will never eat. Round of applause, please, for Dome Sweet Dome. Also a great way to communicate uh, research in a creative manner. So our last presentation for this block today is presented by Andrew and Andreas. Um, they are presenting 2100, A Diverse Landscape for All. So if I could get you to, to the stage, please, and big round of applause, please, for Andrew and Andreas. Hello. 
2100, a bleak business as usual affair. What if we keep going with the simplification of our food system? We choose convenience. Probably we end up with corn and vitamin pills. Not so sustainable, not so good for food security, and incredibly boring. But that could be where we're heading. Of 30,000 edible species, 60% of our calories come from just three. And not only is species diversity very small, but cultivar diversity too. Over the last 100 years, species, cultivar diversity has declined rapidly, from thousands to perhaps just a handful, perhaps 5 or 10% of what used to be available. But what if we changed that? What if we begin breeding now for the future? Sea crops, saltwater crops, freshwater crops, tree crops, even crops we already know and love. In 2100, we have the most diverse food system we've ever had. We can use automation, mechanization, not only to connect people to their food, but also to their farmers, and also solve challenges of diversity, such as labor and processing issues, also transport. And what are the consequences of this? We achieve food security. We create food where it's needed, even in the harshest environments. We reduce our impact on the environment. Diversity leads to diversity. We create habitats, leading to greater biodiversity. Tasty Healthier food, healthier diets, healthier people. And with diversity in the food system, we create diverse business opportunities, which lead to diverse economic opportunities. And finally, we put food back at the center of our cultures. So if you'd like to work with us on breeding a different future, you know where to find us. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and Andrew and Andreas will be here during lunchtime, so you'll be able to speak with them as well. So this brings us to the end of this part of the event. Um, so you've seen many presentations, the, three, the two board games and the puppet show, which you'll be able to interact with over lunch, and then our last three presenters now. So I would like to have another big round of applause for all our teams that prepared today. And to give the closing remarks for this part of the event, I would like to invite Anthony Vorskor to the stage, the Program Lead for Food and Water Security from Wageningen University and Research. Thank you, Anthony. Is my microphone working? Yes, it is. Um, well, it's always uh, a difficult task to be between you and lunch, but uh, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, first, some uh, maybe boring announcements, but I heard the term KB35 a lot. That's what I do for my job, but maybe you think, KB35, what is it? Uh, actually, it's the, you can see it over here, it's the program, the Wageningen Research-Wide Program on Water and Food Security. And uh, within this program, we try to have all the eight, nine uh, Wageningen Research Institutes to collaborate on certain topics. So here they collaborate on... Uh, food security and water. And one of the projects, of which uh, Simon is a uh, project leader, is uh, on uh, the visions of the future food systems. And, uh, well, we already had this uh, last year, and we, we thought, well, how can we make this into a greater event? And maybe we should do something, maybe with, with student challenge or so, and, and so we also uh, came in, in touch with Miriam Trost and, and, and her team, on the student challenge, and I thought, well, why not do the day together? And um, well, as I'm, as we saw today, I think I'm really excited that that this all uh, turned out the right way because we have all these people from Wageningen, but also a lot of students, and this creates an, an amazing energy. And uh, I'm I'm really happy to see that at least the morning part was a, a great success, and I'm sure that also the afternoon will be very exciting. Um, so maybe you think that we are all only playing games all day, 
you saw the, uh, several board games and, uh, and, and plays. And in fact, it is. But it, it is a serious game. So we, we take it very seriously. We think about the future very seriously. But of course, in collaborating, it's already the fun of uh, doing things together. And I think that's also that you should keep in mind. Try to, also by collaboration, it's already a lot of fun to do these things. And that's also what we like for the, for the future. Well, one little piece of the future, uh, because uh, this KB35 is coming to an end, end of this year. But also, uh, we are thinking about the future KB programs. And one of the names of the new program is uh, Future Food Systems. So, that's a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, we'll see what this will bring about. I don't know if whether I will be working uh, still on uh, on the KB program yet, because there's many things that are changing, but uh, at least I liked it very much, what I've been doing uh, up to now. And I hope that you will also be enjoying the rest of the day. And by that, I will hand back the word to Marie. Anthony. Thank you very much. And so now, right before lunch, we have 10 more pitches. Um, and so remember that these pitches are the ones that you can vote for as the audience. And in the afternoon program, there is a series of other awards that um, our finalists uh, will also be in the running for. So um, first up for our next pitch presentation is uh, Perma Voltix from the Netherlands. If I can get this team and a big round of applause for this team. At Permavoltaics, we have one mission. To stop desertification and jumpstart the sustainable development of rural communities around the world. We will do so by leveraging the shaded microclimate underneath semi-transparent solar panels to create resilient food forests faster using less water. Strategically integrating these plots into complete watershed redesign enables us to regenerate entire regions quicker. These systems will power a standalone, community-owned energy hub, facilitating education and accelerating development. As a steward-owned company, we are able to fund and manage these projects without compromising on our mission. Do you want to be part of our solution? Vote and come find us at the market. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. So we are now going to see a video from our team in Ghana who couldn't uh, join us today. So the team is Dinera from Ghana. Big round of applause, please. In sub-Saharan Africa, where you can find Ghana and Team Dinera, about 91 million people suffer from foodborne illnesses every year, leading to about 137,000 deaths. This is as a result of consuming contaminated food and water. This has been worsened in recent times by illegal mining activities, popularly known as Galamse, which has exacerbated the situation, leading to the pollution of over 80 to 90 percent of water bodies used for irrigating agricultural produce and their processing, preservation, and storage. This has led to mutations in these regions, even in animals and newborn babies, and affecting lactating mothers, and most importantly, women. As a team, Dinera set forth to build an app and a USSD and SMS service allowing users to interact with our app via a chat or a prompt to get to know foods that are safe and get updates on how to consume their calorie contents and whether they are safe or not and even providing insight on where those food came from. So thank you to Team Ghana. I now invite our uh, team from Nepal, the Yam Novators. Big round of applause. Thanks, good luck. Let me tell you a story about an underdeveloped and neglected crop of Nepal. Now, in Nepal, there is an underdeveloped um, community called the Chepang community, where 90% of the people are below the poverty line. They rely on yam as a staple food, but they fail to explore its market possibilities and are trapped in subsistence farming. Through our innovative solution, we have developed market-based products such as yam chips, 
pickles and flowers. We have conducted market researches and we have successfully sold 56 different yam products in the farmer's market. This shows our scalability. Our yam products have been successful in showing the people of the Chebang community that um, we can scale up our project and uh, we have convinced the farmers that they can convert into commercial yam farming. So together with us yam innovators, let this not just be a project, but a movement towards empowering the Chebang people to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's not easy having to stick with one minute, particularly when you've got the pressure of the audience watching as well. So um, we now have another video from a team that couldn't join us here in person today. So we have our Kenya team, Agro Slakpla. Big round of applause, please. Did you know that urban areas have limited access to arable land for farming? People living within urban areas such as cities and towns experience hardship in growing vegetable crops for daily consumption. This has led to food insecurity within these urban areas. It is therefore important to come up with a sustainable alternative farming technique in cities and towns. Angrosapla therefore advocates for the use of available, little available space within urban regions to grow leafy vegetable crops such as amaranthas within all Sinigani sacks, with also the use of recycled water bottles, which act as a slow drain for efficient water utilization. Therefore, if we facilitate agrosapular farming techniques to people living within urban areas, we shall generate income and curb food insecurity while fostering green ecology. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Before our next five pitches, of course, it's a bit difficult to sit through and maybe some of them all merge into one. And I can see some people sleeping, some people on their phones. So what I would like to do is invite everybody to get up out of their seats so we can move around a little bit, keep the energy flowing. Maybe you can hug someone next to you, <laughs> chat with them. Oh, look at this. See? We've been talking about how we're all connected, how it's important to be together, and that's exactly why we're here today. Oh, look at this love. I love it. Thanks, everyone. So please take a seat. Get ready for the next block of pictures. So our next pitch is... We have the team uh, from Agroboros from the Netherlands. If I can get a really big round of applause for this team. <laughs> Thanks. What will we eat if no one grows food? Well, the answer is clear. We will face severe hunger. One of the main reasons jeopardizing our food security is the growing disconnect between youth and farming. To tackle this issue, we created Agroboros, an educational program aiming at reconnecting children with agriculture through hands-on and creative learnings on farms, schools, and public events. This summer, Agroboros took root in France, partnering with over 10 organizations and hosting six, six on-farm events. We engaged with more than 25 children and their caregivers, and we successfully tested six of our activities focused on food systems literacy and agroecology. We are dedicated to our mission wherever it is needed, demonstrating that sustainable food systems are not only necessities, they are also a captivating learning subject. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. If I can now invite Women Feeding Cities from Brazil. Big round of applause, please. Thank you. Good luck. In Brazil, we have 
two alarming problems. 50% of women and their families face food insecurity, not only hunger, but also social and mental bad conditions. Also, 25% of urban lands in Brazil are idled, becoming frequently wasteland. We decide to transform in this reality by empowering vulnerable women to become urban farmers, producing fresh and safe food on these idle lands. We create an app and this app connects women for support, owners, landowners for creating urban gardens and the market for sale. We are not only an initiative, we are a social revolution. We nurse not only drink bodies, but drinks. Grandmas, it's to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now, our next pitch is from Uganda, Fruitastic Five. Big round of applause, please. Can you see it? A busy market filled with vibrant colors and the sweet aroma of fresh fruit. However, countless overripe fruits remain unbought and uneaten, resulting in food loss. 40% of jackfruit in Uganda is wasted in a similar manner. Team Fruitastic 5 is solving this problem by adding value to jackfruit. How? We are producing delicious fruit leather snacks that, are, that have an extended shelf life and have high nutritional value. By doing this, we are promoting, we are promoting, <laughs> by doing this, we are improving food security, reducing food waste, and empowering communities through, inc through increasing income for vendors. Thank you. Thank you, and very nice to bring a sample of the work that you're doing as well. Yes, very nice. So we have three more pitches to go. Um, now I would like to invite Entro Pro from Suriname. Big round of applause, please. Good afternoon. I'm Kirti from Entro Pro, representing Suriname. And we are facing a growing crisis in our poultry industry. Imagine being a poultry farmer, and the cost of your chicken feed has increased by 500% in just four years, affecting you and the consumer. But we as Entepro have a sustainable solution for this problem. Black soldier fly larvae, a affordable and local protein source for your chicken feed. With our biopod system, with our biopod system, this larvae transform organic waste into high quality feed and organic fertilizers in just 48 days, reducing import costs, empowering local farmers, and supports a circular economy. It's now time to use local resources in Suriname's food system. That's why we as Antepro are, are supporting a sustainable opportunities with Black Soldier Fly Larvae. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Our next speaker is from Nigeria, and can we shake it up for the sugar shakers? I just arrived in Netherlands, and I tried out this troop waffle, and the taste amazingly wonderful. I know you like them as well. Well, why we like them so much is because 25% of this troop waffle is made of sugar. Ladies and gentlemen, because we consume so much sugar, there is a global health crisis. Too much sugar leads to obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. Moreover, there is a pressing need for natural sweeteners that promote sustainable farming and responsible consumption. 
To solve these problems, we, the sugar shakers, have produced an organic date syrup by the implementation of the hazard analysis and critical control point system. Now, this system aims to identify, to access, and to control potential hazards to ensure the safety and the quality of our product. In our trials, we have shown that our product is a safe and a viable alternative to refined sugar in terms of its essential mineral nutrients and its low sucrose content. And guess what? We are ready for the next big step. Join us as we redefine sweetness and health. And together, let us shake up the world of nutrition. Thank you. The doubt. Very nice work, and nice to bring it back to something that's very familiar to all of us. So, our last pitch is from Ethiopia, and I would like to invite the Green Scholars. Thank you. Malnutrition is a huge problem in Ethiopia. Uh, that is why the government has a declaration named by the, the place in my region called Sokota Declarations. Vegetable consumption is low in Ethiopia, including my home city, Dersi. Even my families consume vegetables only in three rainy seasons. Therefore, with the Green Scholars aim to address this problem uh, through promoting and producing organic vegetables at the school and expanding to the householders. We, already, uh, we have already grown 10 types of vegetables and uh, vegetables at the at, uh, vertically and horizontally at the two schools and expand to the households. Uh, we want to make food, uh, vegetable consumption a culture of my hometown and uh, region. So who wants to enable us to move forward? Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. So that's the end of our pitch uh, competition. So the pitches, as you can see, you've got to squeeze all the work into one minute to really show you what really they have. Each of the teams have to offer, and you can imagine as well that many um, that have just arrived on Friday, some on Saturday, are still feeling that. Uh, jet lag from coming all the way from uh, Latin America, uh, e Eastern Africa and Nepal. So now it's up to you to vote. So I'd like everybody to get out your phones. So we're going to now show a QR code. And we're, you're also going to see a presentation soon of all of the 17 pictures. Just a really short uh, recap of what you saw today so that you can try and remember and you know who to vote for. Great, so I see most people have logged in already. So we'll now show a short presentation of the 17 pictures that you saw today. So if you're wondering what you're voting for, this is for the audience award. So it's really something that really stuck out for you. What was your favorite? And the audience award is worth 500 euros. Great, so I see most people are either have voted already or are voting, but the QR code is there in case you missed it from before. Yeah, I can't 
Okay. So there seems to be a lock on the voting. If I can uh, signal to my tech team at the back. Okay, great. <laughs> You're kicked out again. Okay, please be patient and we'll uh, sort that out. Can everybody vote now? No. No. I'm getting some thumbs up. Is it saying that you're blocked out of voting? No internet. Okay. There is Wi-Fi that you can connect to or hotspot from your neighbor. But those that do have internet, can you vote? Super. Great. So our voting ends, and while we tally up the results, we're going to show a promo video of next year's challenge, because we know that there are many students here in the room, um, and so if you feel inspired from this year's challenge, we would like to invite you to participate in next year's challenge, which is on nature-based solutions in food systems. inspired and those who are eligible, please apply for next year's challenge. So I'm now waiting for our audience winner. An envelope's going to come down any moment now. If I can get everyone to stamp your feet. And uh, so, I don't know if we have to repeat uh, the voting or not. Oh, uh, he's waving that we have to wait, but I don't know what that, mean, that means. <laughs> can somebody, uh, can the boys over there, you want to participate next year, right, in the challenge? Can you go <laughs> ask them what's going on? <laughs> so, all students of Wagner University, yeah, you can really uh, participate next year. The resilient agriculture uh, students and... Uh, that are here with Mariana. Can you combine it with your pizza Yeah, sure. If, if the teachers agree, you can combine it. Um, but that's something we, we will discuss uh, together. And um, there are, yeah, there are, th we are very happy if, uh, if teachers are willing to also combine things with our challenge. So that's, uh, that's good news. So we're doing business now. Okay. <laughs> so is it, oh, is it good? Do we have a winner? Okay, then maybe we, you can give the envelope to uh, the boy there. <laughs> I don't know your name, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and then the flower girl is there over there. <laughs> Guus. Hoofs. Guus. <laughs> can Guus bring the envelope? <laughs> so it's really, this is really a live show, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, if you're watching at home. <laughs> So, yeah, the tension is building, I think. I see the students. It's, uh, this, we did not 
think of this beforehand to make it more uh, exciting. Okay. Yes, thank you. Guus, Guus is coming down. Then the flowers are coming from that side. <laughs> oh, Guus, can you also bring the, uh, the check behind the, behind, behind the chairs? There's a check. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay, great. So I'm about to announce the winner. The check is on its way down with our now a new member of our team. In yes. case you didn't realize, you've now been hired. Oh, yes, sure. yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You can hand it. You can. Yeah, you can. You can hand it. So I'm going to announce the winner, and once I announce the winner of the Audience Award, I would like that winner to come and join us on the stage, and uh, we would just like to hear a bit about how you feel of winning. So if I can also get another round of applause on the, your feet. Yeah, nice. And the winner of the Audience Award is the Sugar Shakers from Nigeria. Woo! Congratulations, Sugar Shakers. I know maybe also the crew can come because there's a lot of staff from the University of Abuja present. So they, maybe they can join the stage for the, for the video, for the photos. Peter, congratulations. So, so you will get a, a flower from... So I don't, also don't know your name, I'm sorry. Floor. Floor will give the flower. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so is there, there's uh, photo time and everything. You, you can go with him and then, uh, and then I will uh, stop talking. <laughs> Great, so thank you very much. Thank you, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, nice work. <laughs> Thank you so much. So that's one of many awards that will be given. More awards will be awarded uh, this afternoon. So this brings us to the end of this morning session. So uh, during lunch, we've said it a couple of times, but if you would like to play the games, please join the teams down in the quantum rooms. Uh, if you would like um, to uh, meet and interact with the puppets, please go to the corridor. And of course, enjoy your lunch. It's outside. Everyone is welcome for lunch. We want to reduce food waste, so please have lunch and eat. <laughs> yeah. Don't be shy. It's okay. Um, and so I would also like to um, use this opportunity to say thank you very much for being an amazing audience. I will not be your moderator for this afternoon program, so I'd like to thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the team and everyone here this morning for all your energy and all your participation. So thank you so much. Thank you.